are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal, and joining us once again is our good friend, uh, Professor Richard Wolf. Uh, you know, uh, you know Professor Wolf's work uh, at democracyatwork.info, uh, hosting economic update on free speech TV. He's an economist, and and economic historian and uh we talk with him regularly and always look forward to it so first of all richard wolf welcome back to the program thank you very much rj glad to be here i was glad to have you and you know you may have noticed uh been a lot of bad weather lately and uh, the experts are telling pakistan one-third of pakistan underwater at one point now florida hurricane ian of course puerto rico getting pounded once again we're told uh, well we start to pull on the thread to, uh, to all this well you man-made climate change is certainly intensifying these storms the scientists tell us uh, uh climate change is driven by consumption particularly of fossil fuels it seems to me our economic system is based on uh, a theory of perpetual growth a new movement as you well know in both in economics and in uh, general political and historical commentary is degrowth the idea that we cannot and should not live with the idea that we will always be growing 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 because uh, economically because that means more consumption uh more exchange uh and ultimately more exploitation of of earth and humans alike and so degrowth is starting to t take wider and wider traction as an idea what are your ideas about degrowth well for me uh i love talking about it because it allows me to do what's even more exciting for me which is to examine to analyze capitalism in a critical perspective but to link the criticism of capitalism to the kinds of issues that are becoming urgent in our own times. Because if you want a theoretical framework like anti-capitalism to be thought about, to be, to be considered seriously, then linking it to an urgent present problem is a way, is a way to do that. Uh, so, so allow me a couple of minutes just to lay out sure. how I see it. Capitalism is a bizarre si system. If you take a step back and you look at it with a little bit of distance, like every economic system, it has on the one hand resources. And by resources, I mean the trees growing on the land, the metals and minerals below the surface of the land, the air, the water, the soil, and then the people, the people whose brains and muscles can interact, we call it work, interact with what nature gives us to produce a truly spectacular array of goods and services to enhance life as an experience. And all economic systems have resources on the one hand, and needs and desires of people or outputs on the other. Every system has that. What capitalism is unique in is that it interjects between the resources and people on the one hand and the needs and desires we all have on the other, a very small group of people, we call them employers, who engage, we call that hiring, the vast majority of us as employees. And then here comes the key point. They organize the production of the goods and services that are supposed to please us all by using the land, the water, the soil, the minerals, and everything else so that we get what those minerals plus our own labor is capable of producing. But the weird, strange thing, these people are not given the task of using the resources to meet the needs of the people. 
if that were their task, the first thing they do is find out what people need and want and then use their skills to mobilize the production that needs to meet those ends. They don't do that. They go to a particular school, a business school, most of these employers. I've taught in business schools, so I really know what they learn. They learn that the point and purpose of the enterprise they are going to lead as a member of the board of directors or as the CEO or as an executive, whatever it is, the point and purpose is to make a profit. Wait a minute. No, 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 no. I want to shout. Your job isn't to make a profit for a handful of people. You know, the major shareholders. Let's remember, most business in America is done by corporations. The top 10% of people own 80% of the shares of the corporations. So if you're making a profit, if that's your goal, then you are serving a tiny minority of the people whose incomes are profit. Those are the shareholders, the top executives, and so on. And you're organizing your economy to produce profit. Now, one of the most important side effects of the focus on profits is the need to grow your enterprise. You must expand. You have to. You have to have a larger market share. In other words, your company has to be a bigger fish in whatever pond it swims in. You have to, why do you have to grow? Number one, all the companies you do business with will assess your health as an enterprise according to how much profits you're making, both absolutely and as a rate of profit in terms of your uh, success as an inventive or an investing entity. Your workers will be comfortable or not about working for you if you're profitable or not, if they can see a future in a growing, so they don't have to worry that you're not growing and therefore might be shrinking because it means their jobs are now at risk. And then perhaps the most important thing, mm -hmm. you're stuck in competing with other companies. The key variable to determine how successful you'll be in that competition is how much profits you have. Will you have enough profits to buy the new technology? Will you have enough profits to move production to Puerto Rico or China or wherever you can get, here we go, cheaper workers, better profits? In other words, growth is the necessity to get the profits which are the sign of whether you are a success or a failure. You want your career to sparkle, you better be in a company that's growing. You want your career to die on you, then you be in a company whose statistics indicate it's shrinking. So degrowth is for the capitalist, the profit-driven CEO, the exact opposite of everything they're trying to do. That's why a society like ours that says, for example, we cannot keep uh, exploiting the resources of our planet, it will kill us, and therefore we should stop growing, that message hits the ears of a CEO, and that CEO becomes instantaneously deaf. He can't take that in, even if he agrees with the ecological ideas behind it, he can't. He'll be fired tomorrow if he proposes to the board of directors or the major shareholders a program by which they will become a, 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 a smaller. This, this, in our culture, he'd be, he'd be referred to a psychiatrist for having the very idea in his mind. And every person in the business knows this. Therefore, and there's no alternative to this, if you're serious about degrowth, 
about having an attitude towards nature of mutual responsibility, nature to us, we to nature, that we have to preserve the natural environment or else it won't be there for us. To have that mentality brings you right up against the core logic of the capitalist system. Having said that, Having said one more thing, let me just throw it all at you. Sure. You know, either you believe in democracy or you don't. I understand. Some do, some don't. But if you believe in democracy, then here's what it means for me, and I do. So you know, I'll put my cards on the table. It means that all of us, together, one person, one vote, however this is organized, have to make and live by majority decisions about the key issues in life. You know, whether we'll have a government, whether we'll have elections, uh, whether we'll have a high-tech society or not, oh, all the others. Therefore, for me, the question, should we be a society driven by growth or should we be a society driven by a mutually protective relationship between the human race, the animals, and the plants, and the planet, and I'm in favor of the latter, then I want that to be determined democratically. Mm -hmm. I want there to be a democratic discussion, a democratic debate in our society with all points of view having equal opportunity to make their case, and then let the, the let the democratic decisions go. Why are we allowing those of us who take democracy seriously? Why are we allowing the the less than one percent of us who are employers, the less than ten percent of us who own the overwhelming majority of stocks and bonds in our? Why are we letting them? impose on us this profit system that makes the discussion of degrowth merely bullshit, you know, words that we all throw around right. because there's no mechanism, and you can see it now. A tiny group of people make a decision, and I'm not debating whether the decision is right or wrong, but they make a decision to wage economic war against Russia because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As I say, put aside that issue. One of the consequences is the growth opportunity for the fossil fuel industry is spectacular. The price, as everyone knows, the price of gas and oil have gone through the roof. That makes fracking and every other device to get more oil and gas out of the ground profitable and if it's profitable what are we seeing we're seeing more drilling we're seeing more exploration we've restarted closed coal mines because of the desperate need for but of course there's no desperate here at all if you take away the invasion of of ukraine or if you don't leave it if you take away the sanctioned program, then we don't have an explosion of prices of those goods, and therefore we don't set in motion the profit frenzy to take advantage of these higher prices by doing things we know are destructive to the environment. At least there ought to be, if you believe in democracy, some sort of process to discuss and debate this. Nothing. We are having none of it. Tiny groups of people make these decisions. We all live with the consequences. And I think degrowth, as clearly as anything, puts us right up against facing that the consequences of capitalism are such that we're long overdue to ask what ought to by now be the obvious question. Why in the world do we keep a system that imposes on us behavior we already know is not good for us? You, I'm glad you've brought up democracy several times, Richard Wolf, for uh, a, a couple reasons. One of them is that while you've just given an 
eloquent indictment of the economic system we live under and the masters of it, the CEOs and others who run it, uh, of course, this system couldn't exist without the encouragement and tolerance, well, tolerance is far too mild. We're without the support of our political class and uh, their advisors, including your, your colleagues in the economics profession, right? And my colleagues in the journalistic profession, both of whom are extremely culpable in this process. So allow me to just take a minute to use a prosaic example, okay? I love strawberries. I love strawberries, but I've given up I don't buy them that much anymore because I find that in the supermarket, the quality isn't good. If I go to make a fruit salad, I'm cutting out so much of the strawberry. I've got 50% of the strawberry volume I bought by the time I'm done. Okay. So, plus I don't like to take, you know, I'm perfectionist. I don't like to take all that time with a knife. I'm tired at night. So, uh, if I were to get ambitious and grow strawberry bushes, uh, two things would happen. I would have a more reliable source of edible strawberries during the appropriate season. But every time I go to the, uh, the uh, grocery store, your profession and my profession talks about something called the GDP, right? And they're saying, we want the GDP to grow. And, you know, Democrats will put out these charts. GDP grows more under Democratic presidents than Republicans. Republicans will counter with something but there's an assumption in my world, in my profession, your profession, generally assumption, growth is good. So if I decide to grow strawberries instead of buying them, uh, I, a tiny shrinkage, that's bad, quote unquote, even though I spend less money, I have better strawberries. Multiply, multiply that out. You and I are old enough to remember there was something called the back to the land movement, you know, out of the hippies, right? Now, I don't even know if there's a f enough affordable arable land in this country anymore, but let's assume there is. Let's assume a million people decided that the hell with this, we're going to go, we're going to buy farmland, we're going to farm it cooperatively, we'll buy, if they're not vegans, we'll buy a few animals, we'll raise them, we'll plant all the crops we need. They arguably would have a better quality of life. They don't have to go to jobs they hate anymore. They, you know, they, they're in the fresh air. And, um, and yet, for your profession and mine, the way we report on what we call economics, that would be a disaster, wouldn't it? Absolutely. But I think you force me to say, and I'm glad you do, that my profession, when it comes to these kinds of questions, is complicit in a way that is becoming criminal. I mean, I don't know how else to make the point I, I want to make. You're absolutely right. Growth becomes a fetish. We have worked our profession under the leadership of corporate America. We have taught generations of students that the health of a society is measured. Every few weeks, we get a measure from our government, GDP has grown or not. If it hasn't grown, we all groan with the sad reality that the GDP only shrank by a half a percent or something. And then we applaud if it has gone up by two or three percent, you know, the race between the Chinese economic development and the American over the last 35 years was mostly carried out uh, to the advantage of the Chinese who've won that competition. Hands down, that's over. But why? Because the GDP in China for the last 30 years grew six to nine percent a year. And the GDP in this country, U.S., grew two to three percent per year over the same period of time. I mean, that's a no-brainer. That's a three-to-one ratio maintained over 20, 30 years. Uh, but of course, GDP is all about this growth fetish. Right. You know, and you and I have talked about this before. Think of the, the lunacy, just the way the GDP is calculated. It doesn't really do what it claims to do. If, if, if millions of women, and this happened in recent U.S. history, if millions of women who worked very hard in the household 
raising children, cleaning the household, buying the food, preparing the food, uh, taking care of the elderly, all the things that household housewives did. If none of that was counted, it isn't counted to this day. As I'm speaking to you, that work and all the output is not counted. If those women, which they started doing in the 1970s, either got divorced or started working outside the home without getting divorced, either way, the minute they entered into the wage labor system, their labor got counted. The GDP went up, but that's stupid. It didn't, of course. One kind of work, which wasn't counted, was done less, and another kind of work done with a wage went up, but the, the way the things are counted, we only counted the upside, not the down. Therefore, the real GDP, you could argue, is much worse than the numbers suggest because of this bizarre. And you know, why is that, you ask? Why didn't they count the women? It's for the same reason that they fetishize growth. That's the way capitalism worked. For the capitalist, what counts is the worker in the factory, in the office, in the store, how much you pay him and how much work you can get out of him. What happens at home, you're not interested. It's not part of your business. It doesn't figure in your profits. If that man goes home and works at home, you don't. Care. You only care, is he coming back in the morning to do it again? If the woman is busy at home, doesn't affect you. If she's an employee, you want her there on time, you want her to be productive, suddenly you get very interested. The notion that we don't have to care about what the women are doing in the house as economists is crazy. Because of course, whether that woman is working too hard, getting too tired, unable to take care of the children, will shape everything in that society. What women do at the household is as important to social development as anything else that happens outside the household. A moment's thought will teach you that. But we don't do that. We have the, if the capitalist doesn't count it, we don't think it matters. If the capitalist doesn't care about the damage to the environment, because he's making profit this year, next year, and the year after, and the long-term effects are not his business. That'll be the headache of the CEO 10 years from now when he hopefully has moved on to a higher job. This crazy arrangement, you know, yeah, it teaches people ways of thinking, but those ways of thinking are trapped inside the system as it's already going, and that's the break we have to make. And it's being made, the ecological movement, to their credit, has at least been able to say, hey, we haven't counted something which is now coming back to threaten our very existence. It scares people. They don't quite want to face it. Even the people who talk about it, seeing at least half of them that I encounter, to somehow think this problem will solve itself, it never has. It's not doing it now, and the notion that it's going to becomes even more bizarre than that we've gone as far as we have without facing it. The issue is the dominance of the capitalist way of arranging society with a tiny minority uh, in the position to make all the big decisions, the employers, and a vast army of employees who pretty much do what we're told and live with the results of what those decision makers do, which is about profit for them as the priority, not what we as a society want in our interactions with the natural environment we depend on. If you take a step back, it's crazy what we are doing. You know, I was thinking as you were talking, and this may be a little bit of a digression, I hope not. Um, but I was thinking as you were talking about, you know, how would I communicate all this to, let's say, the Donald Trump base, right? Rural, conservative, hardcore, Christian, right wing, you know, you name it, all the terms. Well, but, you know, maybe that's too big an ask for now. But one thing that occurred to mind is, is that these, this system, telling those people, this system, when you're in church, worthless. 
doesn't matter because you're not buying and you're not working. This system, when you're hugging your children, worthless because you're not buying, you're not working. Those mountains you love, those rivers you love, those valleys you love, worth nothing, meaningless, garbage as far as the system is concerned. Uh, it's just something, I don't know, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah. No, no, I think it, once you see it, then you begin, you know, it's like, you never notice that people have a certain kind of illness. And then when someone is close to you and gets that illness, suddenly you become aware of all the other people you hear about who have that illness and who can share with you what they did for it or how they coped with it and so on. And I think you, you, you see the same thing. You're seeing the same thing, that this craziness begins to, to, to open you up to seeing the multiple ways in which this is crazy. Let me throw a few more at you just, just to, to get people's juices, mental juices flowing here. In the United States, we pay significantly higher wages to the individuals who park our cars in parking garages than we do to the young people, mostly women, who are in charge of our daycare centers. Every child psychologist I know, and I'm married to one, uh, and she's taught me a lot, every child psychologist knows that those early years, one to five, one to four, are absolutely formative, as they are, by the way, with many animals. They're formative of a great deal about who we are as we mature, as we get older and adults and all, much of that is that this is a very important time in the development of the human being. They need encouragement. They need stimulation. They need support. They need a whole host of things to be provided to them so that they can begin to realize their own potential to achieve all that they have in them to achieve. And yet, in our society, given the way the profit system works, and this has been true for many decades, what I'm saying, we pay more to the people who put our cars in the garage than we do to the people who are in charge of our little ones for many hours, five days a week. Uh, there is no sense uh, to any of this. We pay our public school teachers unbelievably lousy wages. Why? I'm an economist. I can tell you that in my profession, th the following statement is agreed to by virtually everyone. The future of the United States in the world economy depends more than on anything else on the quality and the quantity of young people coming out of our colleges and universities and our public school system. Spending low amounts of money, pinching the budgets of our schools and universities is self-destructive. Companies that don't want to pay taxes, and that includes about 99.7% mm, of them, therefore are withholding in every gambit, legal and illegal, they can think of the resources to make even their enterprises survive. When human beings that are smart, Americans are as smart as anybody else, behave in ways that are so you know, transparently self-destructive without a debate, without a conversation, then you can begin to think Something is terribly wrong here. That's got to start people thinking. So I think the, the examples you gave, we should be multiplying them all over the lot. And it, it is unfortunately not difficult uh, to do. It's like not giving your people, I, I don't know what the numbers are now, but 30 million Americans still have no uh, health care insurance. Right. What are you doing? What what in the world are you doing? This is you are destroying these people by not giving them proper health care. You are destroying those that they love and are interdependent with. You're incurring medical expenses forever in every emergency room in the hospital, which every emergency 
hospital room will tell you they are already in crisis mode. I've, I recently visited, I won't mention where, uh, uh, an emergency room in a hospital uh, on gurneys, wounded people in the hallways because they don't have enough doctors, they don't have enough rooms, they don't have enough nurses. So people lie for hours, some dying by the way, on gurneys in a hallway that the public walks through. I mean, it, it, you, you, you say to yourself, these are not scenes that a normal, rational per person can observe without something going off in their brain saying this is wrong. I mean, this is, this is like watching a baby starve by the side of the road when you have a, a, a car full of groceries. You can't really do that. And if you do do it, then there's something terribly wrong with you. And, you know, as we abuse people's body, I, I, bodies, as you describe, uh, I, I can't help but thinking we, we abuse their, uh, their spirits, their minds as well. You know, children, you talked about children, you know, children not being given the opportunity to let their imaginations run wild. And, yeah. and I know we're running out of time, but I think of Jonathan Kozal, young yeah. teacher who wrote a book called Death at an Early Age. He had an example where he stood up on the wall in his elementary school classroom was a sign that said if you like history here are some job possibilities for you teacher a librarian and I forget the other and he said he took his crayon and added to it um, revolutionary martyr and, and saint you know but I mean the idea that we have this sort of desiccated dry dead imagination that we want to inculcate in our children instead of man you can be anything you can do anything you can grow up and advocate for degrowth once you find out what that is the world is open to you but that's my closing thought i guess what's yours well mine mine is that I, I i want everyone to think about it to think what it means if we decided not to make profit the central idea but make the quality of the life of our people. That's what we're going to focus on. That's what we're going to maximize. That's what we're going to sacrifice other projects in order to make the lives we lead. So everybody gets guaranteed a job. Everybody gets guaranteed health care, a, a decent education. And we allocate our resources to make people have the greatest support for developing themselves that we possibly can. We put profit aside, become secondary, tertiary. The world will not end. The world is not dependent on the profit system. Capitalism, which is the profit system par excellence, is 400 years old. That's all. The human race is thousands of years old. We don't need to imagine that we're imprisoned in this relatively short phased enterprise. And if we can see that it falls short of what we need and want, then we have every right, like the slaves before us and the serfs before us and the village people before us, to change our system so it serves us better. As the poet William Blake said, everything real was once just imagined. So on that note, Richard Wolf, economist, economic historian, host of Economic Update, as always, wonderful speaking with you. And as always, thank you for coming on the program. And thank you. You know, getting my juices going is one of the reasons I really enjoy talking with you. These are such important topics. And I think most people would also enjoy having a chance to think about it and to act and to have some influence over the outcome. Nothing could be more important, especially at these hard times in this country. Well said. Thank you again. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.